Dr. Watts, um, you've written multiple books um, on Roman history. Um, and one of the things that I really enjoy and appreciate about your books, uh, whether it be uh, The Eternal Decline and Fall of Rome, um, or you know The Final Pagan Generation, City and School, um, you emphasize that these changes that we today look as seismic shifts in culture really aren't the result of decisive things. They're, they're more small changes resulting over time that people have contemporaneous with what's happening um, don't really think that too far ahead about in, in some cases. Um, and that's especially the case here with this period of time that we're discussing, which is that generation in the fourth century, you know, right before Constantine, but, you know, and then you have others who are younger um, who were born after that and are just seeing this world for the first time in terms of Christian ascendance. So, um, but perhaps we need to clarify our terms a little bit more. So mm -hmm. when we say the final pagan generation, what exactly is meant by that phrase? So what I was trying to do with this book is talk about this process, as I think you, you summed up very well, of the world changing in a very dramatic way so that the basic rules of how the world works uh, no longer apply. And how is it that you can be born into a world with one set of basic rules, die in a world with a different set of basic rules, and not really understand that that's what's happening, you know, that that's the story of your life. Um, and so this was a book that was motivated in part by, you know, me as a Gen Xer, uh, realizing, I was entering middle age, and realizing that, you know, we probably are not going to have a president. We definitely are not going to shape the country. Um, it's going to be baby boomers hanging on for as long as baby boomers can. And then millennials are going to take over and Gen X is just going to kind of watch. Um, and the story that we imagined would be the story that would be told about our generation is not going to be the story people tell about us. Um, they may not say anything about us, uh, but right now it seems to be like we have a nice burst of music that we made in the 90s and early 2000s. And that was kind of it. That's our contribution. Um, so what does it mean to live through a lifetime where you think you're writing a particular story and you think that you're a character playing a particular role in a particular story? And in the end, that's not the story anybody tells about your world and it's not the story anybody tells about you. Um, and so the final pagan generation is the generation that believed that they were born into a world where religious life was going to be just like it had always been for thousands of years. Um, there would be hundreds of hundreds or thousands of temples in every city. There would be gods in every corner. You would see pagan gods everywhere. Every house would um, be filled with incense as people prayed to those gods. Uh, you would hear routinely, like maybe every day if the city's big enough, pagan religious festivals and processions and people chanting and people carrying images of gods. That's how it had always been. And that's how you could always expect it would be. And so the story that these people um, imagine they are going to tell across their lifetime is a story of good Roman citizens who are educated in the appropriate way. They take up government jobs or public service jobs, and they make a name for themselves within the context of a very well-defined Roman political and social system that rewards people who um, speak well, uh, perform public activities in a way that doesn't disrupt anything, um, and serve their cities and serve their empire in the ways that their emperors demand. That's what these people think their life is going to be like. And so they structure everything that they're doing around training to, to participate in this system and training to excel once they're participating and building the relationships with emperors and governors and people who are powerful that is going to let them deliver the big speech that defines this imperial policy or um, perform before the great audience in Athens or Alexandria or Rome or uh, Constantinople. Um, that's how they think they're going to be measured. But the story that we tell of the people born in the three tens is not that story. It's not about their great triumphs in you know, the uh, arena of public display in the city of Constantinople or the great panegyric that they gave to the Emperor Theodosius following his treaty with the Goths. It's a story of the world becoming Christian. 
And these people born in the 310s had no idea that was going to be the story. And they don't behave like people who are participating in that story. They're participating in a totally different world that gradually flickers out. And by the time they're in their 70s, they realize it. You know, they realize that this isn't that what they thought their life would be is not what their life has become. What they thought their world would be is not what their world has become. The rules that they thought govern their society are no longer the rules that, that govern their society. And things as basic as, you know, the religious laws of gravity no longer apply. The festivals are done. The processions don't occur. The gods don't show up. The temples are closed. All of these things that were not even thought as possible things that would disappear are gone. Uh, and these people live in a world that looks nothing like the one they were born into. And so that's the final pagan generation. Um, these aren't just pagans. You know, Christians too, um, who are born in the 310s, also suffer from this, this kind of um, dislocation as the world they thought they were living in disappears. Uh, and the world that they emerge into is something that becomes less and less comfortable to them. Even Christians who are living in an empire where Christianity is now becoming a majority religion, they don't recognize that world and how it functions because it's not something that they ever imagined could occur. Um, and the structures of it are not things that they understand. I love the, um, the analogy you kind of make uh, early on about uh, the photo at Woodstock. And uh, you're like, this book is about the equivalent of the people who are uh, getting up, going to work every day, washing their car versus um, this idea as, as, as history in general, as, as a, a kind of discipline, we, we tend to overlook that. Um, these are real people living in real time versus yeah. um, the idea that we kind of have in a textbook, like you were just talking about the Gen X thing. And, and me as like somebody who's kind of in between, I'm not quite Gen X, I'm not quite millennial. I was kind of born in between. So, you know, I, I, I kind of looked at a, maybe the way certain younger Christians during this final pagan generation period of time looked on um, the ideals of, of Christians, like for me, like music, we're talking about music. Like I, I kind of totally rejected that type of music. And I was like, oh, I think I'm, I'm more into like Depeche Mode and The Cure than than Nirvana or whatever. <laughs> and I really got picked on about that. Uh, but uh, it was just, it's kind of the same thing. Like you have this, uh, we don't realize that even those small um, gaps in age um, and the period of time we're uh, growing up in um, really make a huge difference in terms of how we see things. So for um you know the older generation uh they have ideals concerns and an overall attitude towards um how to handle things and how to conduct themselves that perhaps the younger younger counterparts younger counterparts do not have um so you know they think of christianity they're like okay i remember not too long ago that was like a persecuted minority um, or at the most tolerated, but not really influential versus a younger person would see an ascendancy and they'd be like, you know, they don't understand the concept of the persecution and they don't have the same kind of reaction to things. Perhaps they react more um, boldly. They're emboldened by these changes, um, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, so in the book, you focus on uh, these few characters, uh, these four figures in particular, uh, Libanius, Themistius, um, Praetix, Praetix Tatus, and uh, Asonius. I'm, I'm sorry if I butchered those names, yeah. but, uh, but what, was it about these, <laughs> what was it about these figures? Yay, my, uh, my classical Greek training uh, <laughs> uh, lately has been paying off. But uh, what was it about these figures in particular that, um, what was it about them that made them ideal subjects for you to focus on during, in this in this text. So there were there were a few things that really appealed to them or really appealed to me about treating them. Um, I up until that point in my career I'd mainly worked on Greek stuff and mainly worked on the Eastern Empire. Uh, and so I wanted to have Western representation in this, but also in the um, period around 310, the empire is divided. It's still divided into four. There was an emperor in the 280s and 290s who created a structure called the Tetrarchy where instead of having one capital in the city of Rome, he created kind of regional courts, um, four regional courts that were close to areas where the Roman frontier were threatened. So there was a, a center in um, what's now Trier. At that point, 
Trier is you know very near the border of um, where Luxembourg and France and and Germany come together, um, and so it's part of the province of Gaul. Um, it's where Asonius was from. I mean, he's not from Trier, but he's from the province of Gaul. Uh, he's from Bordeaux, actually. Um, Italy, Fredrik Stadis is from the city of Rome, and so that's another one of the quarters of the Tetrarchy. Uh, the city of Nicomedia is a tetrarchic capital. That's where um, Themistius's first job teaching was. And Themistius actually lives in Constantinople, which is the capital that Constantine sets up. And then uh, Libanius is from Syria. And so he's from kind of the fourth part of that um, division. And so I thought it would be interesting to trace the careers of these people across the changes that occur in this space. but in a way that also allows us to speak to the particular experiences of each of those different regions. Because this, I think, the argument that I wanted to make is that we need to slow down and look at the changes of the fourth century on the personal level, you know, at the speed of a person's daily life and not speed up through the periods that we think are boring, you know, like the late 360s, everybody thinks it's boring. It's actually really interesting stuff are happening if you look at this from the level of the individuals who are living through them. Um, and I also wanted to be sure that we were talking about a full geographic range of the Roman Empire. Uh, the other thing is that in the fourth century, these people are incredibly prolific. So we have lots of Asonius, we have tons of Libanius, we have lots of Themistius. Um, we have not that much writing of Pridextatus, but Pridextatus is a very, very important figure in the city of Rome. Uh, and so there's lots of documentation of Pridextatus' activity, and he appears as a character in a lot of different pieces of literature we have from this time period. So these are people who are extremely well documented from um, a wide range of areas um, and backgrounds across the Roman Empire. And we can document more or less what they're doing across almost sort of every year of their life, in many cases at least, um, we have data points for you know every few years of their life. Um, and so we have an incredibly comprehensive picture of the evolution and daily lives of these individuals across a, a range of territory, across a big range of time. Um, and all of them live, they're born in the 310s and all of them live into at least the 380s. Um, and so they cover the full sort of scope of Rome's evolution from the pagan dominated society of the 310s that's, you know, maybe 10% Christian to the Christian majority society of the 380s and early 390s. Um, and so they offer a really remarkable way to not only talk about this big development, but also slow it down and look at the individual day-to-day um, -day experiences of somebody pursuing their personal objectives and their daily goals um, in a society that's changing in ways that they don't notice or understand. They're, they're really inheriting the uh, post-Diocletian uh, tetrarchic structure in the world that left behind. Um, and to get back to the younger, um, the younger lions, if you will, uh, they, seem, <laughs> they seem emboldened by the rise of Christianity. Uh, they increasingly, um, unfortunately, like you mentioned in your book, The Mortal Republic, it seems there, there's an issue with <laughs> these people uh, kind of seeing violence as a legitimate resort. Uh, but, but in this particular aspect of uh, um, perspective and time, what was it about this uh, change in culture that made them see this as a, as a legitimate kind of resort to uh, solve issues? Well, why did they become increasingly violent? We know, we know, um, in a previous discussion, we were talking about Hatiroi, about Mathetes, about, you know, students. And, and, you know, we know that there was already kind of like in that youth culture, there was always, there were riots and there were lots of violence. Um, but what was, what was it about um, this particular cultural shift that uh, lent, lent itself to this? I think the way that I would maybe see it is um, the Christian empire is something no one ever expected to happen. They didn't even know what it was supposed to be. You know, when Constantine converts to Christianity, uh, nobody knows what the next step is supposed to be, right? Persecution ends, great. Now what? Uh, and it takes about a generation for them to come up with even a, a roadmap for what a Christian Roman Empire might look like. Um, and the roadmap they come up with is, is pretty radical. 
Um, it's something that apparently is lifted from basically the only account that they could find of a society that um, in the past had converted to a mon the monotheism of the God of, of Christianity. And they, so they took this from the Old Testament and they looked at the conquest of um, you know, the promised land by the Israelites. And that was the model, right? Um, the Old Testament talks about uh, shutting temples and, you know, and building um, places for people to worship the, Christ the uh, Jewish God. And then paganism melted away. And we know that's not true, but they didn't know that was not true. That was the story they had. And that was what the next step became. Um, but as this new world that they imagine starts getting created, people who are younger begin to become eager to explore the new world and to map it and to chart its boundaries and to chart its limits. Uh, and so the, the final pagan generation born in the 310s were very much creatures of a Roman society where there were rules. Um, and if you played by those rules, you got predictable rewards. Um, and if you were talented and played by those rules, you got more rewards. Um, and so people flocked into to schools to get educated, to get sort of credentialed so they could enter government service so that they could play in this system and play by those rules and get the predictable rewards and their parents expected this. Uh, but by the 350s and 360s, the first attempts to explore what this Christian, this new Christian Roman world will look like yield things that are not in any way consistent with that old model of playing by the rules and, and getting rewards through the system. Um, they begin to find things like guys in Egypt living in the desert, you know, people like Antony who claim that education and jobs in society and property and family and connection to cities all are less meaningful than an embrace of a particularly um, determined pursuit of Christian philosophy, Christian knowledge, a, an extreme Christian life outside of the rules and systems of society. And this is uh, something that gets publicized widely when the Bishop Athanasius of Alexandria writes a biography of Antony. Um, it becomes a bestseller immediately. I mean, it's translated into Latin almost immediately. Um, it's eventually translated into Armenian, to Syriac, to Coptic. And by 400, this has become sort of a worldwide worldwide-ish bestseller. Um, and it inspires young people to say, even though I, you know, I went to law school or even though I, I became a rhetorician, um, I don't find this fulfilling. I don't want to do this anymore. These rewards that the society promises me if I play by the rules, I actually don't want them. They don't mean anything. Uh, I want to do something that is consistent with what I believe to be the 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 boundaries of this new Christian world. And I want to live in this new way that we're just discovering is possible. Um, and it becomes incredibly disruptive because the benefit of that system that the pagan gener final pagan generation lived in is people in charge could control what you did by controlling what rewards you got and what kinds of conduct they approved of. They have no control over somebody who says, I don't care what you do to me. I don't need your money. I don't need your honor. I don't need your social status. I don't need your uh, offices. I don't need your attention. Um, you know, leave me alone and let me do what I think is best. Emperors don't really have a way to control somebody like that. Governors don't have a way to control somebody like that. Even bishops don't really have a way to control somebody like that. Um, and so this becomes intoxicating to a generation that has kind of seen their parents, um, to borrow a 20th century metaphor, you know, run the nine to five until they died. It's not worth it to them. You know, they saw the rat race leaves nowhere, leads nowhere. They saw that regular jobs led nowhere. They don't want it anymore. And they want to do something that they think is pure and honest um, and more rewarding and a product of this new world that is just being discovered rather than this old world that has existed and its limits are fully apparent to everybody. Uh, and so this is the generational challenge. The final pagan generation cannot understand these people. They don't understand the world that they're creating. They don't understand its rules. And they don't understand why these people are turning their back on the sorts of values that their generation treasured and that their generation saw as kind of almost laws of gravity for how one behaved in a Roman society. Um, and so it's incredibly bewildering uh, and disorienting to them to be living in a world where they are getting older 
And these young people with these crazy ideas are the ones determining how their society is going to function. It was like an explosive powder keg of a, a culture war. It was like uh, the uh, self, we, we, we take for granted that, oh, with Constantine from then on, like Christianity was on the ascent, but it, it wasn't necessarily that way for, yeah. for quite a while. It was, uh, it was something where uh, you have the uh, self-definition of Christianity uh, with, you know, taking from the Jewish martyrs, you know, Book of Maccabees, things like that. And, uh, you know, taking, like you were saying, the Hebrew Bible uh, concepts and creating that identity, especially when they're experiencing these persecutions versus the well-established uh, culture of Rome and the ideals that it was exemplifying. Um, they really were on a zero hour collision course. Yeah. And it could, at that time, it really could have been, it could have gone either way. Like, um, who knows what would have happened if Julian had stayed around a little bit longer, perhaps. Um, but yeah, um, Dr. Watts, this has opened a lot of <laughs> further ideas for discussion. And I hope <laughs> you will join me again to um, explore these topics. Um, for sure. But in the meantime, uh, tell everybody where they can find you. So uh, my books are all on Amazon uh, and you can also, and Barnes and Noble and wherever you get your books. Uh, and I also have a YouTube channel called The Eternal Decline of Rome uh, that has some lectures about Roman history, some long form things. And I'm starting up some short form things focusing on monuments and probably even Roman coins. So um, definitely check that out and hopefully you'll enjoy that.